So, uh, the, the topic I have for you today uh, is, is one that uh, I'm quite passionate about because I think it involves uh, a serious public health issue. And it, it has to do with baby powder. Um, you can imagine uh, a year ago when I first uh, got wind of this case, uh, the response from a few of my partners, and men, in fact, I continued to get this response, was baby powder? Really, Ted? You're, you're going to sue somebody over baby powder? Um, it, it's gentle and mild. Uh, a sprinkle a day keeps the odor away. It's soft enough for a baby's bottom. Uh, that's what we've been hearing for decades, right? Uh, from a company called Johnson & Johnson, who's been selling uh, their baby powder for over a hundred years. Uh, they started selling it in the 1890s. And uh, those are the jingles that we have heard. Uh, those are the jingles that have led us to believe that baby powder is safe. Uh, and I think that after I show you a few documents today, you'll see that it is anything but. First learned about this case a little over a year ago. Uh, there was actually a verdict out of South Dakota. A solo practitioner out of Mississippi, uh, who had been working on uh, silica cases, stumbled onto some medical literature that, that, that showed an increased risk of ovarian cancer from genital talc use. And um, I, uh, when I read it, it, it intrigued me. I investigated and I found that uh, that particular case involved not, not uh, you know, junk science, but Harvard uh, experts, not one, but two, who testified in that case. Uh, and a jury that uh, determined that there was uh, not only causation of this particular woman's ovarian cancer, but that the company had failed to warn about the risk of ovarian cancer. Um, and that I, I went to uh, Andy and told him what I was seeing, and, and he said, well, let's ask Jerry to put that in the Jerry Beasley report, uh, which, by the way, I hope you all get and, and read. And if you don't, come to one of us and, and yank us by the coat and tell me, put me on that mailing list. You can find out a lot about a, a litigation that's out there that's hot uh, that, uh, that you need to be involved in, that you need to be looking out for. Um, Jerry published an article about, uh, about this, and the first call I got was from this Mississippi lawyer uh, who said, hey, I'm a solo guy. There's no way I can take on Johnson & Johnson by myself. Will you help me out? And uh, that's we got involved with Alan in that case and uh, and his Harvard experts, and uh, we, I, I think it's going to turn out to be a really good case. Here's why I think so. What is talc? Uh, Dee alluded to this. Talc is a mineral that's mined from the earth, um, and it is a su the main substance that you find in talcum powders like baby powder uh, and shower to shower. It's Talc is marketed, uh, it, you know, as, as mentioned by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, there are numerous companies that sell uh, various types of baby uh, or body powders, including Gold Bond and Avon. Uh, so far, the cases that we're looking at are principally against Johnson & Johnson because we know uh, from the documents that have been retrieved that, uh, that Johnson & Johnson has decades of knowledge of this risk. Now, there's been some litigation over the years um, about uh, the in inhalation of asbestos-tainted talc, um, and some of that litigation continues, and actually I think it started heating up again. It involves mesothelioma claims. The claims I want to talk to you about today uh, involve uh, ovarian cancer from the genital use of talc. How do we know that talcum powder causes ovarian cancer? Well, there are 20 epidemiological studies that show that there is an increased risk of ovarian cancer when a woman uses uh, talcum powder in the genital area. Those particular studies are what we call ever-use studies, meaning uh, if a woman has ever used uh, powder in the genital area, it, uh, there, there's, uh, there are varying degrees of increased risk. Um, and I think that one reason why many lawyers have not yet gotten involved in this litigation is because they stop there. Uh, those studies show, as I said, varying degrees, some of them uh, a lower degree of risk, some of them up into the 90% range. Um, but 
uh, you'll notice uh, if you look, if you squint, you can see that uh, one of the authors in this particular uh, presentation was Dr. Daniel Kramer. And uh, he has taken data uh, from many studies and he has been able to quantify what happens not just to women who ever use it, but what happens to women who use it on a continuous basis. And the highlights you see there of the 2.12 and the 3.53, you, you don't have to be a statistician to, to, to really uh, understand this. What he is saying is that for women who use talc powder in the genital area for five years uh, have, it, have doubling of the risk, uh, over 100% increased risk from using talc powder in the genital area. And for women who use it in excess of 20 years, it, there's a tripling of the risk. These numbers are important to us lawyers when we go into Daubert hearings uh, to get our experts qualified. Uh, it's something that, uh, that judges look at and, uh, you know, right or wrong, they uh, put a lot of weight behind the two number that you see there, the 2.12. This is another uh, indicator of, of uh, how we know that talc causes ovarian cancer. This, you could go to the National Cancer Institute website right now on your iPhone and you'll see that the NCI says that talc uh, is a risk factor for ovarian cancer. And not only do they say it's a risk factor, but they talk about how it, ha how it can happen uh, by using it in the genital area. Now, what did Johnson & Johnson know and when did they know it? It's a question we ask in every type of, of exposure case. Um, and I think you're going to be surprised and, and probably shocked at how long they've known about this. There are studies from the 1960s uh, that show that particles similar to talc can translocate from the exterior of the genit genitalia all the way to the, o to the ovaries. Uh, the, uh, one of the most recent uh, studies that, that addressed talc particles uh, themselves was in 1971. Uh, the Henderson study found uh, talc particles not just on uh, cancer uh, slides or, or tissue slides, but as in their words, deeply embedded within the cancerous tumor. The, the, the importance of that language of deeply embedded is that what we find is that uh, Johnson & Johnson likes to say oftentimes that uh, a particular tissue uh, was contaminated, maybe by uh, a medical professional who was wearing gloves with, with powder on it. Well, deeply embedded means that these pathologists were able to determine that these top particles were not sitting on top of the, of the tissue, they were down, within, down in the, in the uh, embedded within the tissue. Now, a little side note here. One of the things that we know as pharmaceutical lawyers is that a drug company has a responsibility to keep an eye on the uh, medical literature uh, that's published. Uh, and they'll admit to that. Indeed, they've admitted to it in this case. Uh, they embrace that duty and they say that they have people who watch all the studies that come out. So we know that they knew about the Henderson study that I, I just showed you. And we also know that they've seen these 20 or so that I mentioned earlier, uh, other studies that uh, talk about the increased risk. This is the first study uh, that really brought talc to the forefront uh, as, as uh, being associated with ovarian cancer. And as you can see, it's uh, published in 1982 by our friend Dr. Daniel Kramer from Harvard. Uh, Dr. Kramer has been jumping up and down for about three or four decades now, trying to get people's attention about this risk. Uh, when he published this study in 1982, Johnson & Johnson came to him to challenge him on his findings. He told them in 1982, uh, not only are you wrong, uh, but you need to either take this product off the market or put a warning label on the bottles of baby powder. Um, and I'll show you later that they have not done that to this day. This is an internal Johnson & Johnson document, 1986. Uh, this is a technological forecast. Uh, this comes on the heels of uh, some concerns about declining sales. 
And in this forecast, Johnson Johnson acknowledges that uh, uh, there's a growing concern about uh, cosmetic powders, such as baby powder. They go on to talk about how there are retrospective studies, uh, probably referring to Dr. Kramer and others, uh, that show uh, or implicate talc as causing uh, ovarian cancer. This is the second red flag, at a minimum, that they've had. Fast forward to 1994, another internal Johnson & Johnson document, a letter from the Cancer Prevention Coalition. In it, uh, the author writes to the president and CEO of Johnson & Johnson and says uh, that talcum powder is a serious risk when it comes to ovarian cancer. So when Rio Tinto would mine the talc out of the ground, they would grind it up to, to Johnson & Johnson specifications. They would put it into a either container or a bag, and then they would attach this MSDA sheet to that container before it was shipped out. This is to provide warnings to the employees or, who are handling it there at Rio Tinto, and to provide a warning to those at the receiving end, in this case Johnson & Johnson, that this is a hazardous material, and that if these employees have an accidental spill, that they might be exposed to a carcinogen. What we know is that Johnson & Johnson would receive these, they would tear these off of the, of the container that the talc came in and throw the MSTS sheet away. How do we know that? This is the warning that consumers get. The talc is delivered to Johnson & Johnson with a warning. They rip it off. They literally take the bottle that you see in this picture and they pour 99% of it is talc into this bottle and they sprinkle a little fragrance in there and they screw the top on and they send it to the Walgreens that you go to or the CVS that you go to and buy their product. There's absolutely no warning about ovarian cancer, no warning about uh, how it should be used and where it, where it should be used on the body. The shower to shower product not only does not have anything about uh, babies breathing it, the word warning is not anywhere on the, on the bottle. One of the uh, theories of liability that we have in these types of cases is that uh, there, you know, is there a safer alternative? Assuming that, that uh, baby powder is a necessary product, uh, is there something else that could be provided to women for use? You'll see here, this is a, 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 a press release by an expert at Brigham, Brigham Williams, and uh, she says that she believes that women should be warned of the risk of genital use of talcum powder. And she says that if women feel like they need something to use, cornstarch is an alternative, a safer alternative to be used. Indeed, when you go into these drug stores today, you will find baby powder and shower to shower next to uh, bottles made by Johnson & Johnson and other companies that include cornstarch. Why they've not switched to cornstarch uh, and taken talc off the market, we don't know yet. I suspect it has something to do with profit margin. Uh, we will be finding out in coming depositions. This is a... Uh, uh, a page out of the transcript of the uh, South Dakota case I alluded to earlier. In that case, a judge, the, the trial judge in that case, uh, found that there was sufficient evidence from the documents that I've that I've kind of that I've alluded to uh, that Johnson and Johnson uh, might be found liable for punitive damages. These are strong cases. These are cases that are worthy of your attention. Um, and indeed, ovarian cancer is a, is a tragic uh, disease that uh, is quite lethal. Uh, oftentimes, women uh, confuse the symptoms that they're having of ovarian cancer with their monthly cycle. And therefore, uh, months and sometimes years go by before they uh, are diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And that by then, oftentimes, it's too late. Um, the litigation as it stands right now, um, we've filed uh, a number of cases already. We have uh, uh, over 200 and approaching 300 cases that we have filed in St. Louis City Court. 
Uh, we've filed some cases in New Jersey as well, about a dozen cases there. Uh, Dee's already told you about the consumer class action that's filed. Um, this litigation is on its way. Um, the South Dakota case gave us a glimpse uh, of what's out there in the way of liability documents. And uh, I think that we're going to find out more and more information as we go forward with depositions and more, and more documents are produced.